Hello everyone, happy Monday and welcome to another episode of Everything Vive. My name is Zane, I'm here with Ronnie. Ronnie, how's it going, man? It is going great. How are you doing? Ready for another week. I know it's been a busy weekend, but uh, here we go with Monday again. <laughs> so, a uh, couple of big things. We're going to talk specifically Vive today and keep our focus there. Um, I think one of the first big things that we came across was the announcement or just, I guess, the rumor that the HTC Vive generation number two is currently under development or currently in development. And I think it's going under the code name Oasis. Uh, I believe they've mm-hmm. stayed away from calling it the HTC Vive 2 uh, until they can further name it with something. And so I don't know. What have you heard about it? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. You know, right now it's just internally going by that code name and there isn't, you know, a whole lot of other details. I'm kind of curious now if they're already working on on some kind of, uh, you know, second headset, if they're going to wait for, uh, you know, those those new controllers to come out with that, or if they're just going to, you know, this could also be, as we're going to discuss later on, uh, potentially a project that HCC is working on for, you know, other reasons besides just home consumer level VR. Uh, so regardless, I mean, it's it's not surprising that they're working on a new headset. It's you know we'll just have to keep our eyes and ears open to see exactly what that means if if it's going to be a full generation ahead or if it's just going to be you know you know certain tweaks maybe uh, a wireless headset for example is I think one of the rumors uh, was going going on but you know I don't know what, what about what do you think. Well, so one of the the more interesting things that I came across in an article I was reading uh, was the use of the wording "evolve" and how. Hmm. I mean, I, I normally wouldn't take that word to go one way or the other, but it looks as though using the word "evolve" uh, for that article made it seem as though they would not be like a sweeping overhaul of changes, and rather mm-hmm. something a little bit more incremental. Uh, yeah. You know, I, and I don't know, I guess I don't really know what constitutes incremental over, you know, something that's completely redone. Because uh, to me, yeah, removing removing the wires and making it wireless, while that can be looked at as an incremental change, I mean, that totally, uh, totally revitalizes the experience. Like, it changes it completely, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with the controllers, I, those might be something I would say might fall under the incremental changes, but I think any little thing that helps to get the user in a more enhanced enhanced experience, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I guess I'm just curious, what would be these major changes that they're talking about? Yeah, no, and likewise, I mean, the more I'm kind of thinking about it right now, I, since there hasn't been a whole lot of time between, you know, the first launch of, of the Vive and, and this upcoming project, either we're quite a ways away from it being released and these are just rumors of what people are working on or, you know, I, I do think it'll be more incremental because I mean, even the computer hardware that would be required to push a new headset, I mean, we're not really talking, it hasn't really been long enough to where com- like most GPUs and computers that people will be using will be significantly more powerful so I, I, I highly doubt that you would have a headset with, you know, 4K displays, for example, or something like that in it that would, you know, raise the resolution. Because I just don't think it would be very cost effective for most people. It's really, it's, I mean, it's pretty much impossible right now to run a VR game in that, that high of a resolution, regardless of what you're willing to spend on a computer. So. So I kind of, you know, and resolution is one of those big things when people are talking about new headsets. Everyone, you know, wants to have a clearer image and everything. So considering I don't think that's really possible yet, um, I'm I'm wondering, yeah, if it's just them working on 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 new tech for you know two to three years out, or, or kind of what the deal is. But yeah, it's interesting nonetheless. Yeah, so so here's the thing. Uh, when it comes to, I guess, just the tech being rolled out on a, on a more regular basis, you know, this came out in April, which is, uh, what, I want to say seven months ago at this point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, by the time we get to next April, looking at 
other companies. So I, I guess I'm specifically thinking about Apple, or at least I have them in mind, and how they they roll out a new generation every month. And I mean, or sorry, not every month, every year. And mm-hmm. again, they I mean they're a little bit more established in what they're trying to do, and so it makes sense for them to add these changes. And they have a cycle, uh, you know, a cycle that they kind of stick to every single year. Mm-hmm. I. I would be really surprised if HTC and Valve were to do the same thing. Um, just because you have 150,000 people that have bought this since April of last year. And so these are the people that are most excited about it. These are the people who are the early adopters that are willing to pay the premium price to have it first. And mm-hmm. if you were to roll out something new, something brand new, just a year later, unless they they somehow found a way to cater to and offer some kind of discount to previous Vive owners, I just feel like that would be such a turnoff to have like a very brand new system out and available Mm -hmm. uh, when people are still discovering the old one. Does it make sense? Yeah. No, I, I, that makes a lot of sense. And I, and I agree with you. I mean, even to the extent that a lot of people that bought Vives are early adopters and, you know, they kind of, get the idea that, you know, this isn't going to last forever and I'm willing to pay a premium. I mean, even those, those, you know, uh, early adopters, I think would be pretty hard pressed to drop down yet another, you know, $800 or so to get another headset. I mean, it would would at least have to be a couple years out, I think, for me to, to, you know, realistically go out and get something like that. And and I think most people are probably the same way. So I I agree with you. I, I don't, I, the, yeah, the more I think about it, I th- it's probably going to be incremental changes and, uh, and, and not a whole lot more than that. But, or, or it's just them starting the new project and we don't see this thing actually materialize until, you know, 2018, something like that. Yeah, I mean, that would make more sense to me. Uh, like I, what I can see happening by, you know, let's just say, let's just use April of next year as a, as a reference. Um, you know, if they stick with like a yearly cycle, I can see them introducing the new controllers by that time, since they already have the prototypes that they were demoing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can also see them implementing a wireless solution. And I know in a previous episode, I think we talked about how they were teaming up with the Bulgarian company Quark VR to Mm -hmm. come up with that, that wireless solution, just because, Again, that to me isn't necessarily an incremental change. That to me is a, very much a game changer. And yeah. if you can be the first company to implement that, that's the biggest complaint anybody who has VR or anybody who's into VR is is working with right now. And sure. if you can get a top line headset to be able to have that feature and ability, and I mean they're really only competing with, I guess Oculus right now for that mainstream Oculus and and PS uh, or PlayStation, and so. PlayStation just came out. Oculus Touch is going to come out in December. And so I think if they want to stay ahead of the game, they're going to have to make sure they're the ones that implement that first. Sure. And I mean, I don't know how how possible it's going to be to get that out soon, but if, if they could do that, and, and, and like I said, there are rumors suggesting that they're trying to work on something like that. I mean, if that's the case, I could also see how they would be able to pitch something like that as being both a major... A major addition, but at the same time, you know, not offending, you know, pr- previous Vive owners. Okay, if if you're really hardcore and you really want to get away from the wires, then by all means, you know, buy another headset. But if, you know, you get, you know, you get kind of, you know, as an early adopter, you, you bought into the hardware before it could become wireless and you can still play all the games, you know, the newest headset still, uh, you know, it's not like it's going to play games that, you know, the older one can't or vice versa. So, so I could see that being kind of like an, a non-offensive way to kind of, you know, roll out a new version of the hardware, but. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think what's really, what's really interesting too, is I know we had a conversation previously about, how uh, HTC was kind of thinking ahead when they were designing their headset. And they, I, I think you were the one telling me that they were able to design it in a way where once they come up with a wireless solution, 
you can actually pop off the front faceplate, can't you? Yeah, I mean, if I mean, it depends on what it would require in order to actually make the headset wireless. Like, I mean, the the cables hook into the into the headset just on that front panel. So yeah, you can you can pop out the cables, and if there were some kind of doggle or something like some, you know, I don't know, like little, you know, connector that you could attach to the headset and make it wireless, then that could work. But I mean, if they're working on a whole new headset. I almost think that it would require something a little bit more drastic in how it manages the the data that it's sending and receiving in order to make sure that it's lag free. But who knows? Yeah, true. Okay, well, we'll be following this uh, obviously a little bit more as it comes along. But I think it is cool to see that they're trying to stay innovative. I know we we've had the same commentary or not criticism, but just I guess praise of of how they're trying to stay ahead of the game. So I really hope that they do continue to focus on, on the areas that will change the, the whole nature of virtual reality. Yeah, I agree. Awesome. Okay. So on to point number two out of two, another uh, big topic that was floating around this week or this past week was the announcement of the Vive port arcade program. And it looks like uh, Vive Land, which is the first of these arcade uh, programs, or the first of these virtual reality arcades, opened in Taiwan last week. And uh, I think the premise behind this, or the reasoning behind it, is that since headsets are generally very expensive, um, at least for the average household, trying to get companies to create like a more public entertainment system rather than just having them be in you know private households. I think it was the the nature behind it, and I I don't know what did you read anything about it or do you have any yeah thoughts on I mean, that? Yeah, so I mean the the most interesting thing that I that I read about it was just the fact that you know this would that developers of of Vive titles would actually be able to opt into the program, and that they would share directly in the revenue that HCC would get um, when basically when people are at these arcades they can purchase you know, certain increments of time that are kind of almost like coins in, a, in an old, you know, in a, in, a, in a traditional arcade sense. And then you can use those coins or minutes and devote them to, to different types of games that have opted in and that will show up and, and pay the developers. So I think this is kind of a cool, I mean, this is basically a really smart way of monetizing uh, the stuff that, that, you know, most Vive owners kind of get to do with their friends, which is, you know, bring a bunch of people over and have them demo a bunch of your games that you purchase and have a lot of fun that way. Well, you know, there's only so many people that know so many people that have vibes. Uh, but this is a chance for, um, for new people to get into the mix. And I mean, you and I were just talking a couple of weeks ago, I think about, uh, you know, about how Oculus had uh, kiosks in Best Buy showing off their hardware and how, you know, we weren't really sure if, if Vive had ever done anything like that, um, you know, in a retail space. So I think this kind of serves two functions. One, it, it introduces more and more people to virtual reality and uh, finds a way to profit, even in situations where people aren't willing to put down the full, the full price of a headset and, you know, if, if they're not into PC gaming, figuring out that side of things, this is a, a quick and simple way that people can, can try out a high-end VR system. And at the same time, if people really, really get into it and really like it, then they do have a way of, of, of purchasing it and bringing it home. So, so I, I think it's a really cool idea. And, and it sounded like, you know, Viveport is kind of the, the, or not Viveport, uh, Viveland is kind of the, uh, the the big kind of flashy uh, main uh, you know best case I guess version of what of what something like this could be but they're going to roll out you know different types of uh, arcades probably in in the U S and Europe as well so um, yeah it sounds like a really cool idea I'll be interested to see what types of places uh, will you know will bring this kind of you know this kind of experience to people, if it's going to be something that, you know, you'd find in, in shopping malls and that kind of thing where people set up kind of boundaries where a a mall kiosk would be and let people experience 
virtual reality that way, or if we're basic, we're going to see it in, you know, movie theaters and in more traditional arcade spaces, it, it'll be interesting to see. No, for sure. And I think the, uh, the benefits are actually twofold. Like you mentioned, the consumer side of it is that, you know, for those who can't drop a couple of grand on a PC and the Vive headset itself, I mean, this is a great way to go out on a Friday night, Saturday night, whatever it is. I mean, I mean, arcades have been like the staple of just like entertainment for the longest time. And I mean, I think we've gotten away from that as certain uh, elements of gaming have become much either cheaper or uh, just very much more personal where people would much rather play, you know, in their homes or online rather than in the comfort of like, uh, oh, sorry, not in the comfort, but in uh, a public space like an arcade. Uh, mm-hmm. Games have also gotten much more complicated, but with virtual reality and where it is right now, I mean, a lot of these are arcade style games and they're fun to play. They're fun to experience with other people, even if you're the only one in the headset. Um, you know, that's kind of how it was back in the day. The only one person can play pinball at a time or one pl- person can play Pac-Man at a time, but everybody kind of shares in that experience. And I think a lot of the games for the Vive right now uh, and just maybe virtual reality in general uh, kind of follow into that pattern. And so this is a great way for people to be introduced, people to spend, you know, what, 20, 25, maybe even $50 max to go out and enjoy a night where they get to experience a lot of the benefits of of virtual reality and a high-end virtual reality set. Uh, and so that to me is, is awesome because it, it, it will help it break into the mainstream a little bit more. Obviously, PlayStation is doing its job in terms of selling units and getting into people's homes, but I think this will show exactly what a high-end unit can do. And on, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, and on the flip side of that, I think for developers, this is also very exciting because now there's a way to revenue share. And I think you alluded to it earlier, uh, but the arcade owners can buy points, which are equivalent to minutes of play. And I think that money is split evenly between HTC and the developers. And so, you know, I'm trying to think of it in a way where 150 headsets out there, sorry, 150,000 headsets out there right now. If you're a developer and you somehow miraculously got everyone to buy your uh, program or app or whatever game it is for $10, you make $1.5 million before taxes, before, um, you know, Whoever, whoever gets their cut of that, which, okay, 1.5 million is not a, you know, that, that's not chump change. That's a good amount of money. But I think for developers, if you're going to be putting in this time and effort and energy, uh, especially for bigger teams, I think they're going to want higher payouts. And so what this does is allow people to re- continue to receive payouts. So it encourages developers to create games, create experiences. Maybe there'll be more arcade like games and experiences, but once they're able to opt in, it's almost an endless amount because you'll have people who will never buy a headset, but they'll go out to an arcade, a VR arcade every weekend with their friends and play a game over and over again. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, it has real potential. And I mean, I don't know if this is reading too much into it, but I mean, it's also possible that some of the new tech that uh, HCC or Valve might be working on for you know a successor headset could be geared more towards an arcade style you know, experience. Who knows? Who knows if if they are if if these companies are really starting to think that uh, that expanding uh, the the consumer base and expanding the the number of people that are exposed to VR is really the goal. Um, that you know, it might be a better approach to go in an arcade uh, direction, and and may and maybe that's how they get around some of that. Uh, you know you know, kind of sting, stinging early adopters and that sort of thing by, well, okay, this is, uh, you know, you have the best consumer headset and now there's going to be this more, you know, industrial, you know, more powerful uh, version of the platform that you can, you have to go to an arcade, an arcade to experience with, you know, very specific types of computer hardware, who knows, but. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I it's mean, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that if they can get some type of return on this and they can see that there is a good amount of interest, you know, worldwide in these arcades and platforms, I can definitely see, you know, our, um, what is it, HTC or even Facebook and Oculus diverting some of their resources to really developing that side because, 
hey, if the money's there, the money's there. And, you know, right now at this point, people, not everyone can have a headset at home, but everyone can go out and spend, you know, X amount of dollars on entertainment for the evening. And you have Mm -hmm. 7 billion people in the world who will be able to partake in this uh, for that price point. Yep, yep. So very interesting things. I I mean, we've even heard uh, from some of the listeners here the idea to develop some of these virtual reality arcades uh, in the U.S. So, I, you know, I'm really excited. I'd love to be able to go to one of these places and just kind of experience what it's like on a public level because mm-hmm. so far it's been very private for us, you know, trying it out at your place or people coming over trying it out at my place. Um, so it'll be cool to see what uh, what elements of VR really shine and stand out in a public setting. But I think no matter yeah. what, you're gonna have you're gonna have elements that will definitely do that. Yeah, no, and I and I think also this is a, a chance for. HTC to help streamline some of this stuff. I mean, a lot of the questions people have about, you know, compliance with local, with local, uh, with local laws and that sort of thing in terms of running a VR arcade. I mean, it's possible that some of that stuff might get ironed out, uh, by HTC basically, you know, setting down some rules and, and making it very clear for people that want to start a business around virtual reality to, to jump on board, you know, their, their own, almost franchise system. So, Yeah, for sure. I mean, again, as, as an HTC Vive owner, it makes me happy to see HTC Valve really pushing the envelope on all different fronts when it comes to virtual reality. So, you know, as long as they are doing their best to stay ahead of the curve, I think that as an HTC Vive owner, I'll continually be in a good spot in terms of, uh, you know, being on a platform that I know will continue to be innovating, that will be continuing to be the very best at what it's trying to do. So enough with the, uh, enough with the, the praise. I think we'll, uh, we'll cut this episode here. Is there anything else, anything else you got, Ronnie? No, I think that's it. So, but, but both of those uh, items are pretty interesting and not exactly what I was expecting, you know, to come up this week, but, but definitely pretty cool news. No, very much so. And and we'll follow that. And hopefully if we can find a VR arcade uh, within driving distance, I'd love to be able to check it out and report back and tell you how our experience is. So uh, with that, I will say uh, have a great rest of your week. I would just like to make one quick plug that we are giving away uh, a few Steam keys for the Containment Initiative giveaway, which we mentioned last week. Uh, we'll be running that through this Thursday and making the announcement on our Game Talk episode this Friday. So quick ways to enter. You can go onto our iTunes page uh, for the podcast and leave a review and rating. Uh, and or you can leave a comment on any of our YouTube videos and make sure you're subscribed. And if you do both of them, then you get two entries in. So uh, we've been hearing from quite a few of you and we are hoping to hear from more of you to give these away uh, within the week. So with that, yeah, any, oh, any kind of feedback is, oh, I was just going to say any kind of feedback is, is welcome. We just like hearing from you guys. So, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, positive, negative, just, you know, whatever, whatever you, uh, you think about the content that Zane and I put up, you know, we'd appreciate, you know, hearing from you guys. So. Yeah, to echo what Ronnie said, I mean, when we started this, uh, I want to say what, six, seven weeks ago at this point, I mean, for us, we just, we love talking about this stuff. So if there are other points of interest that you guys think would be great for us to tackle, or if there's other stuff, if there's stuff that we're talking about that you guys aren't really interested in, definitely let us know. Cause, uh, you know, this is, this is, uh, a way for us to kind of build community around what HCC and Valve are doing. And, you know, we'd love to be, we love the, the ability to connect with you guys and what the podcast has given us so far in being able to do so. So with that being said, you know, make sure you definitely uh, hit us up. Uh, Our website is everythingvibe.com. You can shoot us an email at contact at everythingvibe.com. And of course, uh, we have our YouTube channel, which we're trying to be much more active on now. So uh, anything else you got, Ronnie? No, that's pretty much it. All right, take two. We'll end this one here. Have a great week, guys, <laughs> and we'll have uh, we'll have an inter- another interview for you guys coming up on Wednesday's episode. So, stay tuned and take care.